right, we can go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Paul from VITA. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Mark Wagonseal with us today for another amazing webinar. Today he's going to talk about the analysis, setup principles, and patient satisfaction for class two removable dentures. So, That's a mouthful. <laughs> this is a mouthful, but uh, yeah. it sounds exciting, and it and it sounds like a topic that that really is uh, it's an important one. So uh, I'm looking forward to it, as it looks like everybody else is. So thank you so much, Mark, for joining us today. Uh, some quick housekeeping before Mark gets started. Uh, first is is that you will receive uh, CE credits for this. You should get an email automatically. Uh, if you don't see one, sometimes it takes a day or two. So if you don't see one in the next day or so, uh, let us know and we'll certainly get that out to you. Also, uh, this workshop is being recorded and we can get you a copy of that also. Just let us know. Uh, most of our recordings will be posted on our Vita Learning uh, website or our Vita North America YouTube page. Uh, so you can find um, a bunch of our other stuff there as well. Um, lastly, that's not it. Uh, lastly, the, uh, you guys will all be on mute because we've got a pretty big group today, uh, but there is a questions uh, box in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the control panel on the side over there. So if you guys will type in your questions, I will monitor them and uh, I will ask them and Mark will do his best to answer as we kind of go along. Uh, we'll try and save a little bit of time at the end for questions, but we'll try and answer them as we go so that we don't lose anybody or leave anyone behind. Um, and that's pretty much everything I have on my side. I'm going to turn it over to Mark. And hang on one second. And we will... Mark, show us his magic. Thanks again, Mark. And we'll let me know how else I can help. All right, then. Can you see me? I'm showing my webcam. Can you see me, Paul? Paul? Sorry, Mark. Did it go? Yeah, can you see me? Are we good? Yeah, I can see you and we're ready to go. Hey, all right. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Thanks for taking time out of your busy days to sit and, and join me and uh, as I share my journey for teeth and for patient care as we continue to amp up our denture skills for each and every one of us and be a superhero to the patient. Even though we may not directly see the patient or if we do directly see the patient, there's still a patient there, and we are trying to be a superhero as part of that team to care for that person. So thanks for that, and thanks for joining me. Good morning. We do not slap teeth together. Whoop, whoop. No, we don't. It is far more difficult than that. I'm going to share with you my journey uh, on teeth, and uh, what I wanted to do was to sh just show you a little bit of, of my, my time and my journey and how I craft now a Class 2 Denture. I want to step through just a couple PowerPoints with you a little bit quickly so that there's some background content and information and context to why I do why I do what I do. So thank you again. Thanks to Vita North America for their kind support of our professions and furthering uh, all of our quests to be superheroes. So we appreciate Vita North America's uh, involvement and support of our professions and industry and to Paul today for uh, being the hallway monitor. Thanks, Paul. Whoop, whoop. You get a little sash across across you that says hallway monitor uh, for looking after us. So again, good morning to everyone or good afternoon, wherever you are. A uh, few things. Number one, remember, there is a real chew cycle. So a patient has a chew cycle. So let's get right into it. I'm going to play a video. So this is a video from the University of Strasbourg uh, in France. These are uh, quick little clips of a patient with natural dentition chewing. Uh, but what I want to do is show you that there is a chew cycle. So every one of us has a chew cycle, and this cycle is unique to us. So it's like our fingerprint, it's like our retinal scan. So when you watch, where's the food? The food typically goes on the posterior teeth, on the molars, 
is where you typically see most of the food. The lower's job is to bring the food up to the uppers to be crushed. You need some space there so the food just doesn't get pushed or slipped away. It needs to stay on the teeth to get crushed. So the tongue's job, the cheek's job is, is to also keep the food on. If you look to the upper buccal teeth, so the upper buccal linguals, I don't know, wait a minute, let me rephrase that. So if you look at the posterior teeth, the buccal cusps, they do overlap the lowers and the lower antagonist a little bit. That also is there to facilitate to keep the food on the chew cycle and on the teeth to get crushed. So when you go through and you see these uh, different chew cycles, you'll see that it operates like a teardrop. And these teardrops are different, uh, different kinds. Look at this patient. So this patient has a more vertical teardrop, whereas the other patients had more horizontal teardrops. So everyone has these types of chew cycles and different chew cycles. So that's going to play into this a little bit as, as we move forward and to try and identify that for your patient. So again, chew cycles can be categorized as flat, oval, circular, ovoid, or teardrop. And, and we all kind of have one. So I've learned to train my eye now to see what kind of movement the jaw does when a patient is in my office. So typically what we would what we are trained for in school is to look at someone and see the contour of their teeth, the color, the positioning, the length, all of the phonetic and aesthetic values. But we were never taught to look at how the jaw postures or moves. And it does. It does posture and move even though we're not chewing. There's uh, some tips and tricks that we can do to to facilitate that. And one of that is now to retrain our eye when we watch someone speak. Because when you speak, you usually pronounce the phonetics of, of that language. And the phonetics are like the vowels and the consonants, consonants, so A, E, I, O, U, et cetera. And when we do that, it postures our jaw. And then that'll also give us uh, some context as to the chew cycle. So this is something that I put together. So um, on my journey. So what I've noticed now is that we need that buckle overlap and that this functions within a chew cycle and the lower's job is to take the food to the top. Now this becomes difficult in a class two situation because now we have uh, what dentistry considers to be an abnormal jaw relationship. Uh, and the one thing I want to say right off the bat is Lady Gaga had it right. Uh, baby, you were born this way. So uh, all joking aside, this is who you are, and we celebrate, and I celebrate who who our patient and who my patient is. You are what you are, and and you're beautiful. So if you're class two, class one, class three, I'm here to build your teeth and work within that canvas, and that's all of our goals as we again strive to be superheroes. So we want to be careful that during that chew cycle is that we don't get uh, contact where there's the hit and slide. So the hit and slide becomes the problem for us. Uh, and so we need to identify that in whatever jaw relationship. So I want to show a couple quick videos now of how I identify a chew cycle. So these are patients that are going to be speaking 66 days of the week, months of the year. And I want you to look at their jaw and how they're tracking. So this is a denture patient, complete upper and lower. So watch. You see the jaw move? Even there. There's a chew cycle, there's a teardrop, and you see how it's coming out to her left? It postures out to her left. Look at that. So now I know when I set up teeth in the lab, I need to favor that side because I know she favors that side. So that means there needs to be more clearance on that side. So I need to be able to use product that allows me to be adaptive to the patient and the patient's needs without damaging it while I adapt it. Next patient. This is days of the week, months of the year. Watch her jaw track. See it move to her left? Look at that. I love this video. Like, look at that thing move. Now, when she bites down into centric, everybody, um, this is what she has. 
she I have her in uh, what is that like six to seven millimeters of overbite yet when she opens her mouth that disappears and you don't see it so I'd never build a denture like this 30 years ago when I was uh, you know new to the profession um, because this shouldn't work yet it does because now I've given her freedom so the bites not locked in there's freedom and centric uh, and then I'm following her chew cycle and then I'm giving clearance where necessary for her so i have a very what we would deem to be considered an outrageous uh setup yet it works and then it works aesthetically for her why because i acknowledged baby you were born this way she is what she is and i'm going to work within this uh, and i'm not scared by it because i'm using teeth that allow me that flexibility so the teeth aren't locked together so i use vita lingual form teeth they have freedom and centric so that when you touch them together in centric, they do wiggle a little bit side to side, front to back within about a millimeter. So it's not a bullseye landing type of principle for centric. So I'm able to then favor her left side uh, and clear it a little more for it to work. So I'm going to backtrack and here's a patient, a uh, different patient. Now you see, when you watch, so for that patient, when you see that, it, it looked normal. It, it didn't posture out to the left or right. It didn't come forward a lot. It, it stayed within a fairly uh, compact chew zone and, and chew cycle. So I know, okay, I can sort of set things within the norm in this and not favor a sign. Now for class two cases, we typically see that it's a, it's a, you know, it's a different relationship. Uh, we typically see that the, um, the lower lip, so I'm just going to switch to the pen. Uh, oh, that didn't work so well. Let me, let's try that. See where now I'm showing right here, the orbicular sorus muscle. So typically on class two cases, this right here is gonna be really tight, okay? And when they talk and when you and when you get to get your hands on the patient, you'll see that there's not a lot of room here. So typically this is dislodging the denture. So one of the main issues that we have with a class two case is, is stability of the lower denture. And we as practitioners, and uh, whether we're direct care or in the lab, struggle to find the stability for a denture, uh, especially in the class two. Why is because number one, it's a different jaw relationship. Uh, number two, it's it's not you know considered normal for us in dentistry. And number three, uh, we have a tight muscle structure usually in these types of situations. We need to keep that in mind. So I'm gonna be delving into that as we go through and I do the hands-on portion of this to show you some tricks as to how to gain stability here. Okay, so we're gonna zip ahead. So what I wanted to do is again, just show you this next one. I colored the lower teeth just so that they pop out a little bit. Uh, I am going to, all right, and there we go. So watch her jaw move. move. So yeah, postures forward, comes a little bit to her right. So, how do I identify this? It's usually days of the week and months of the year. Days of the week and months of the year covers the phonetics of that language. So again, the consonants and the vowels of that language. Uh, and then the jaw will posture to, for that. So days of the week, months of the year. And I always have the patient say it in English and their mother language if they have one. And then I'm watching and I'm watching to see what the jaw does and how it moves. And then I'm going to take that information back to when I set teeth. So if I get to determine it, it's great because then I can make a mental note of it. If you don't, then, and you're in a technician and you don't get to see that, so you have some options. Number one, know that it exists then, and know then on the trouble cases, then you can ask to see it, ask to get a video so that you can, again, try to identify it. Because remember, there's no nerve to the denture teeth. Patients cannot feel their teeth hit and touch. And, and then they can't tell you that there's a problem, okay? Now this next patient, this is an upper denture uh, to a lower free end extension cast frame partial. 
the patient has lower anterior natural teeth, and this is him chewing. Again, look at that. There's a chew cycle. See? So it exists, denture patient or not, upper denture, class two, class three, it doesn't matter. There is a chew cycle there. And now the denture teeth have to work and function within that cycle. So a chew cycle influences tooth interaction, and you need to modify the teeth within that interaction regardless of the class. And now on a class two, we have to be careful because again, we have a lower, smaller arch on the bottom. It's more compact, we have less room, and we have a tighter muscle structure, okay? So I wanna show you uh, quickly, um, and just so I'm gonna zip through and show you this video. This is how I want you to start to move an articulator. I want you to move it and now move it like a chew cycle. So it doesn't matter what articulator you have. This is a protar, I, I have a protar, fine. Even a hinge articulator, it doesn't matter, it will move. And I want you to move it like a chew cycle. And, and if you know it, then you can facilitate it. If you don't know it, then just still make a chew cycle. Do you use your best educated guess to do it for these cases? That's gonna help in your stability because what you're doing is you're trying to find the hit and slide points. So again, where the problems lie is the hit and slide where the teeth hit and slide into position. So I'm gonna back this up a little bit because now on here, where the problem lies, and I'm just gonna get my little highlighter here. The problem lies is we, freedom and center denture teeth have this gap. So when the upper cusp comes in, it doesn't have to pinpoint land where it's tight. It, it has a little bit of freedom here. That's the, the beauty of freedom and centric denture teeth. There are only a handful of denture teeth on the market that incorporate this. 99% of the denture teeth, they yes, you hold them in centric, and yes, they work in balance, but in centric, it's tight. So what happens is on the right side, now what you see with the red arrows is the patient's gonna chew and the opposing cusp is gonna hit on the guiding plane and slide into position because it's too tight. Sure, it worked in our articulator. Sure, it worked when we set it up, but that's not how it works in the body in a chew cycle and in a patient where they might have neuromuscular issues. And again, we're asking the articulator can accurately reproduce centric every time. Well, a person can't because why we're alive and now there's food in there to boot. So the hit and slide causes our problems. So we need this gap so that when the tooth comes in and cycles, it can come in and land on this little helicopter pad, as I call it, and not hit and slide into position, okay? So I'm gonna cancel out my highlighter. We're gonna jump forward. Uh, and so again, this is just about, we expect patients to be able to bullseye land every time and you can't. So from a stability perspective for class two, this is where we run into problems, okay? Uh, and again, just to show you what freedom and centric looks like on denture teeth, you can hold it in centric and you can wiggle it side to side and that's freedom in centric. So that's the tooth then being able to rock. So now, yes, we have working and balancing, but in centric, it can wiggle. Remember, they don't have a nerve. There's no nerve to the denture teeth. So the patient can't tell you it's hitting and sliding into position. They have no concept of that. They can only tell you when things are going wrong. Okay? So, we've talked about a chew cycle. We've gone through these videos now to show you some background information. Okay? And now of what it is now with the denture case. So, it's there. So, I'm going to switch out and I'm going to sh show you uh, my next video. So, allow me. So this is the next. So the next video is what we want to do is when I take a, a final impression, I am not using it with a tray with a handle. I've cut the handles off because the handle sticks out and influences the lip. I also don't want a muscle mold by pulling the lip. I want the patient to do it. So this video shows what we do. And what I do is I will insert the tray. I'm going to I'm going to, all right, I'm going to cut the video. So I've inserted the tray and then I asked the patient to give me a kiss. Okay. Now, 
typically what you're going to see from me in these in these videos is I'm going to insert the tray. I'm going to get my hands off the tray. The tray doesn't drop because the material is sticking in the mouth. You always ask the patient to swallow, get some saliva out of the off the tissue. I place the tray in, I let go, and I ask the patient to give me a kiss, like that type of a kiss. What that does, and if you see, look at it move the orbicularis oris on the bottom, okay? So I'm gonna back that up again. Look at it move the orbicularis oris. You see it, the lower muscle. You see how it's moved it? You see how it tightens it? That's why I get them to give me a kiss. So what this does is this muscle molds it. So I build trays without, gosh, I build a tray without a handle, okay? Um, and I place it in the mouth, I get my fingers off the patient, and I ask them to give me a kiss. What that does is that molds the lower and it helps uh, facilitate the muscle molding. So what I'm doing is I'm getting my hands off the patient so that we pick up this sulcus really well in here, because that's what's really gonna matter on a class two is right in here. So that's why I have them give me the kiss and I get my hands off of the patient and I don't pull the lip because I don't wanna stretch it. When I was taught in school, we're taught to grab the lip and you're supposed to pull in a semicircular motion. I don't do that anymore because that's not realistic. I want the patient to give me that information. And for them to do that, then the best way to do that is you put the tray in, you seat it, and you have the patient muscle mold. And blow me that kiss, because then that motion, again, tightens this muscle and then gives me a nice uh, diagram in there. So that's the trick. So these are all little tricks about gaining stability uh, for the case and for a class two. So again, on a class two, remember, so I have wiggle, so I have freedom and centric, so I have the ability for this cusp to wiggle. So I'm using teeth where there's a millimeter little box here to wiggle in. That's gonna play into for us and our advantage as we move forward uh, uh, in today. So I'll show you that. So that was that wiggle motion because again the lower's job is to bring the food up to the upper to get crushed within a chew cycle. Okay? Now in efforts to gain stability in these types of situations, so I have actually let me just uh quickly articulate this so you can see it. There's your healthy class two, okay? Uh, so I'm just gonna drop the pin a little bit on it because uh, there we go, let's do that. That's a healthy class two. So these types of cases can be a real problem for us. So let's go with stability and, and tips of my journey of how I've established that. So I'm gonna take this off. I'm gonna snuggle in and I'm gonna continue to play with the focus button here, everybody. So my apologies. It's always a little harder when we do this uh, on a camera versus live. So the first thing we're going to do is a little bit of model analysis. So what I want to do is I want to circle and I want to find the incisive papilla. So I apologize. I'm going to try to do this as best as I can uh, while looking into a camera. So the first thing is the incisive papilla and we cut it vertically and horizontally so what this does is this gives us um our this gives us our uh, center line for the case if we uh, don't um have that already so this gives us the true center line for the patient and then this will also give us uh this point from here we typically go uh, seven millimeters ahead of this uh to again find the and i can't find my ruler um, here it is. You put everything out on the desk in the morning to get ready. So we usually are going six to seven millimeters ahead of this uh, papilla. Uh, and that's where the incisal edge is going to be. 
Sometimes we can stretch it to nine if we need to. Um, usually what seven does is it puts the incisal edge of the tooth on the wet dry line of the lower lip. So that's statistically where it lands for patients. So uh, what model analysis is gonna do is help us locate uh, where teeth go. Now I'm gonna circle the long branch rugae. So this is the longest rugae in the mouth and you typically find it. And right there is the edge. So now the cuspid is going to be one millimeter plus or minus ahead or behind where this rugae ends. So again, I'm gonna come through and circle here. And again, the dot. Okay, so I'm gonna overemphasize these a little bit just for, because we're on video and on a camera. So what I've done is I've identified where the cuspids go. So what model analysis does is, is it's just that, where we can analyze the model, find anatomical landmarks that help position and tell us where to reference to position the teeth. So now I know where the midline is, now I know where the center of the cuspid should be for this person in relation now to, to their nose and the structure of their face through the cuspid eminence, et cetera, this is where the cuspid should lie on it. So this is gonna become helpful for us in terms of referencing where to place the teeth. Now I'm gonna switch to the bottom, okay? Uh, so what we're gonna to wanna to do on the bottom is we're gonna to wanna to circle the retromolar pad as best we can, okay? So these models have been through the ringer a little bit. So we wanna circle the retromolar pads uh, on them, okay? And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this. Um, so this is like a compass. So I'm gonna just zoom out a little bit. Uh, so what it is is we have it modified. So we have the metal piece and I have a pencil. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this and I'm going to rest and I'm gonna draw the outline of the ridge on the side of the model. So what I'm doing is I'm going to draw the outline of the ridge on the side of the model. So let me do that. So. We do that, okay? And I'm gonna draw that like that. Why does this matter? Well, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reference the horizontal, okay? So that's the plane of the plane of occlusion or the tabletop or the floor, so to speak, okay? And you'll see, now if I try to hold everything, this is where I need more hands, everyone. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna see the reference of the horizontal and right there is the deepest part of the model or the ridge okay so that lines up right about here-ish okay that's the deepest part okay it's actually a little further back pardon me so it's right about in here okay now what is what's the significance of this this is where the lower molar goes so Everyone has a different shape here and, and I customize it for the patient. So everyone has a different shape, which tells me then a different plane uh, and curve of speed. So for this case, it being a class two case, this is where the lower molar is gonna go. This is where I want the lower first molar to go. Specifically, this is gonna aid in our stability. So the first thing was again, a good impression. Uh, a good sulcus here so that we pick up the sulcus and the tightness of the sulcus through the impression by taking an impression without a handle on a tray without a handle and having the patient blow a kiss like this that moves that orbicularis oris muscle and gets it nice and tight and helps me find that out because again that muscle is going to dislodge that denture so I want a nice accurate curvature of the sulcus for that. Now I'm going through model analysis to find out where that lower molar goes. That's also gonna now aid in the stability of the denture. Then I'm using denture teeth that are not locked together in centric. They have that little bit of wiggle in them. 
so that when the patient is moving, they're not, they don't have to bullseye land that centric. There's that little bit of freedom so the cusps don't hit and slide. That's going to aid in the stability of the denture. So I'm going to start to put this together. So allow me a moment. Paul, any questions yet? Okay. If there is, Paul, just jump in. Okay, so allow me a minute. I'm going to do all of this now sort of live, and I'm not going to, I didn't pre-do anything. I wanted to put this together with you guys here, okay? And there's going to be a very specific way I'm going to put this together so that you can see. Now, you don't have to do it this way in, in your own daily practice. I'm going to show this to you just so that you can, I can sort of demonstrate the rationale behind it. Okay, so what we've done is I've identified now where that lower molar goes. So bear with me. Okay, so I've got a bunch of different colors here, but I'm using a lingual form. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to place that lower molar, okay, over that reference mark, so the center, as best as I can, okay? Now, I appreciate that things can get a little tight in here, okay? Um, and we don't always have room because we have to watch where this sits here. So typically um, you have flexibility here. I will always want to put molars in, okay, in a case, because again, the job of the lower is to bring the food to the upper to get crushed. The wider the surface, the wider the table that's there to bring the food up, the better. So I will always favor to have molars instead of premolars. Now in cases that are tight, you can use two second molars instead of a first molar, second molar. That's fine too. So it, it it's based on some of the room that you have available. Okay. So let me just kind of think, get things squared away. So now you're going to say, okay, Mark, how are you referencing your plane of occlusion without any teeth? So actually what I'm doing, uh, bear with me, is when these were articulated, um, I articulated them and we're going to be using our reference point. Where's my ruler? Okay, so from the pin uh, to the height of the retromolar pad. So that's kind of where I'm going. So I already kind of cheated a little bit when I'll use that I'll use the word cheat a little bit, uh, when I uh, mounted these and articulated these. So that's a little trick where we can go in now and, and find a plane of occlusion without putting any anterior teeth in. Because I know now that the reference point, this is 22 millimeters down. So the 22 millimeters is actually lining up. Well, let me just switch that. The 22 millimeters from the sulcus is actually going to be lining up down here. Okay, so if I can kind of show you that. So it's just a little bit of a of a reference point. So uh, for today's purpose too, I just wanted to sh again show you um, about things. I wanted to overemphasize also um, the size of the tooth, uh, just because it pops on the video a little bit better. Okay, uh, when we do this. So bear with me as I as I move forward. Okay. So the second thing we're going to do now. Okay. So I've set the lower molar over the deepest part of the ridge okay so bear with me as i carry on so i'm using model analysis to reference 
anatomical landmarks where the teeth have gone. Because the anatomical landmarks show us where the teeth were when they were in their natural state before they were extracted. So what I'm showing you is all in efforts to maintain stability for a class two. Okay, so that's hardened up a little bit. I'm going to use the upper. I'm going to take some of the wax away. Okay. And I'm going to rest that tooth into position. Okay. Zoom it. Focus. Okay. So what's happening when I do this? And I'm just going to flame it just to seal it into position. Okay. So number one, it's not knuckle tight. Okay. It's not knuckle tight. I don't want it to be. It's a tooth over tooth position. Okay. And now let me just shut my flame off and grab my pen. So I'll show you what my goal is here. Okay. So the goal is this lingual cusp that I'm drawing in red, its job is to fit into the center fossa here. And then, so let me, Okay, so it's not. So I'm gonna take my knife. Let me just get us centered in here and I'm going to, there we go. Push that guy, push that lingual cusp in. Okay. There we go. So again, not knuckle tight. Again, I'm going to color, and now I'm going to color the secondary, so the distal lingual, and there's the mesial lingual, and the distal lingual. Now I'm going to go in. Let me tap that in a little bit. And I'm going to do it just once out of field of vision, okay? Okay. And now, let me go in. It might be hard to see with the camera. And I'll just play with the lighting a little bit, everybody. So what you're gonna see is there's a very faint little red mark here from that distal lingual cusp, and then the red mark here where the um, mesial lingual cusp comes in and rests in. Okay, so it's very faint, but it's there. So that's why I use a pen, because I'm just looking for that faint touch. Okay, so what we're going to see is those cusps touch here and here. Okay, that's where I'm aiming for. All right. And then what you're going to see is that these cusps, they do they do, they are prominent, okay? And they come in, and I'm gonna try and get this. And I'll, let me just take the pin out of the way. Oh, look at, we're trying to get our money shot, look at that. Okay, so, so that lingual cusp rests into the fossa, it's not locked in, so it has that ability to wiggle around. 
We've got the overlap of that buccal cusp because again, its job is to, is to overlap so that it helps keep the food up so it doesn't keep getting squished and pushed out. We don't want knuckle tight so that the food can sit on here and get crushed when the lower brings it up to the upper. And now it's doing that within a chew cycle, okay? All right, so now I'm gonna carry on. So bear with me as I put this all together. Now, because the lower is a smaller arch and the way this is going to piece together, okay, our next tooth that I'm going to set Is the upper premolar okay so the upper premolar is going to come in sorry I did, there we go just like that okay so I'm just going to loop that in a little bit so thanks everybody for watching me work in silence okay next tooth i'm going to put in bear with me i need to eat some wax is the upper first molar so bear with me so I need to fix my chair okay okay one moment I'm just going to go out of field of vision for a second just to seal this so I'm just going to stabilize it against me a little bit to do it So I'll come back into field of vision in just a moment. Okay. All right. Okay. So now I've put the upper. Okay. And now we're going to heat a little more wax. So that was the upper first. I need to find one minute as I'm looking for. There we go. Missed up on the field of vision just for a second. I need to hold this closer to me. So this this class two was a real doozy class two. So I'm going to reach over and grab a couple more extra teeth here. 
this was quite pronounced, so this is going to bode well for us, okay? All right. So this is going to show you a little bit of the flexibility of the situation as we go. Um, because again, this is, this is, whoops, uh, this is quite a significant uh, discrepancy from where this sulcus is to here. So over exaggerated to, again, show the point when I come in here, I'm gonna add in another premolar And now you'll see the molar go in. So this will be kind of neat as we delve into the bottom. Okay. So bear with me here as I just make it pretty. Okay. One minute as I step again out of field of vision, my apologies. Just want to try to get things, as you know, you have to sometimes hold it close to you to get the... I have to redo that. My wax wasn't hot enough. Sorry, the teeth just fell off. Okay, so I'm going to put in, so what you're seeing develop here is this. I have uh, three premolars in and one, one molar, but where's the food get crushed? The food gets crushed back here, not up here. So it's going to go back here. That's the main crushing tooth, okay? I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt, Mark. I've yeah, got a, please got do. A couple of Got a couple of questions here, and Perfect. Uh, some of these are going back a little bit. Uh, first is uh, the, the teeth you're using. Yes. If you can remind everyone what teeth you're using. Yeah. And so I'm using I'm using um I'm using um okay so the articulator is a Cavo Protar Seven articulator so it's a um, uh, adjustable articulator that adjusts also for uh, freedom and centric so the articulator actually wiggles side to side so when I when I open it up you can see it so that facilitates the wiggle motion okay uh, the teeth themselves are Vita lingoform posteriors so that's a freedom and centric tooth so they're not locked together in centric uh, and I'm using Excel so a T46 Excel anterior uh, so it has a little bit of a thicker incisal edge on it um, so that it's uh, it's crafted and strong. These are made from acrylic glass. So all of the teeth are acrylic glass. So if I grind on them, I do not need to adjust them or polish them, pardon me, uh, after because they're self-polishing. That's why I like them. Uh, another question, question uh, does a class two plane of occlusion, is it higher than halfway up the retromolar path? Yeah, okay, so yes-ish, because the jaw is a little further back and smaller, but I've I've seen different, over my years now, I've seen it different. So, I mean, the plane of occlusion, we're gonna reference with the Fox plane uh, and the patient, uh, if you can. Um, but here on this case, I'm, I'm going quite reasonably up the retromolar pad, at least two thirds up the pad. Okay. Excellent. Uh, a couple more quick ones. Uh, first is when you close and open the, the bite in a pro art articulator, does it throw off the bite as a hinged articulator? Um, so the answer to that question is uh, you have to be careful. So if I close the pin six, seven millimeters, then yeah, there could be some discrepancy. The articulator is a little more in line with the skull, so its measurements and angulations are more in line with the average skull measurements of a person. 
So I found over the years that I'm not having to, I can close the pin a little more and get away with a little more on this because it is more in tune uh, with how things are, are developed and set uh, within the skull. So I, I have a little bit of flexibility, but if you're going to, the rule of thumb typically is over three millimeters of closure or opening on the pin, you should probably go back and, and retake the bite. Okay. Awesome. La last one. Uh, do the physio dens also have freedom in center? Yes. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for jumping in, Paul. And we can clear those questions as we go. Uh, so that it stays pertinent to the topic at hand. So thank you. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add in um, the first uh, premolar on the lower. So now you can start to see where things, I got to be careful because now the way the arch is shaping, we don't have a lot of room in here, okay? So what's interesting now is, is I want to start to take stock of where I am on things. Um, so this is going to be fun, given the uh, angulation of everything. So where we're at now is I have my model analysis and my line is coming through and pointing to the cuspid. So I know that my cuspid is in position of where it should be in regards to my model analysis. Because remember, it's the tip of the cuspid to where that dot was okay and and where the dot here on the other side so that dot is underneath so i'm within about a millimeter on that so that's that's good so that's telling me this is correct remember the food is going to be coming back and getting chewed back here for this person okay so now what i'm going to be doing is i'm going to be bringing this forward to finish so how i'm setting this up and how you see this develop for us is I'm, I started with the molar and now I'm working my way forward. I did that for, again, to address stability issues because I want this over the best part of the ridge based on model analysis. And as I move forward, I'm setting the necessary upper teeth to get this cuspid in line with the model analysis. So you saw that I'm using premolars here. Now one would say, well, Mark, could you drop a premolar and add a molar? Um, the answer is, depending on the space available, uh, because the lower arch is, is much smaller in size, I typically don't. Um, I'm using premolars because, again, they're thinner, because now we have to watch this. We have to watch because now I, I'm running out of space here right away, because we're already getting into the anterior region here. So this is the beauty of the teeth that it allows me this flexibility as I continue to to develop the the um, the setup here you'll see it move and and the beauty of it okay so I'm just going to carry on with the upper to just finish off the central and lateral here so I'm going to add some wax in and So bear with me as I sneak out of field of vision every once in a while. Okay. So you have to appreciate this is a little different than what you're normally going to do or see because I started at the back and worked my way front. So do you have to do this, uh, you know, when the webinar is finished and you're working on your own case? Uh, the answer is, well, no, uh, you don't. But what I want to show you is why I did it, okay? And the reasoning behind it, okay? So I let model analysis uh, drive um, what I was doing. And I'm now set up in the center of the papilla there. And if you just allow me a minute, I will make this pretty. 
So this case is, um, I remember this one, it was really unique. Okay, so forgive me, I'm just gonna, there we go. Okay, there we go. Now I'm gonna start to worry about the bottom and how that's gonna work on the bottom, okay? So remember, don't, don't get distracted or concerned with what you see develop here because in time this is going to be in a canvas on a picture frame in someone's mouth with lips and structure hiding everything and it's going to blend in don't get freaked out with what you see here because i used to be you know i'd look at it and go, oh my gosh oh my gosh what am i doing this is terrible no uh, what I've learned after 35 years now caring for patients is it doesn't matter what it looks like on the articulator. It's what it matters when you put it behind lips. Uh, and, and typically, I'm going to laugh, but if it looks really terrible here, it's probably just beautiful in the mouth. So am I right or am I right? So that's why I don't get too freaked out with what I'm seeing down here. What I'm, What's guiding me is, again, uh, model analysis and i'm doing this for now remembering that the muscle structure here is tight so i'm I'm being careful with with what i do okay um so now what we're going to do is is i can go in and i'm gonna set So again, what I'm doing is I'm coming across now and I'm going to set this. Premolar, as, as you can see, I'm coming across the crest of the ridge, okay? And I'm following in. I'm not drifting too much. I'm in here, okay? Let's have to bring the camera up a little bit. Pardon me. Okay. Just a minute, everyone, the camera's in the way. I need to back it off a little bit. One moment. Okay, so now this, this lingual cusp is coming in to rest here, and that is the fossa, the distal fossa okay so this lingual cusp in red is coming into that fossa and then you can see it's not knuckle tight and i've got gapping so that's good so now we have to start to be careful because we're running out of room okay so i'm going to be swinging around here so i'm going to add a little bit more wax And now I'm really watching 
comes swinging around because I'm worried about that tight lip. But the crest of the ridge is right here. Mark that out here. The crest of the ridge is right there, so I'm 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 square on where I need to be. Okay. Now, typically, the first premolar also is the transition tooth, and it's it's where the ridge starts to, to curve. So through model analysis, I know that I'm I'm pretty good on on positioning. And now you're going to see some some cool things. Just lift that a little higher. Okay, so now you're going to see, okay, I'm going to try to get this as best as I can for a camera and the abilities of it focusing. You can see that that lingual cusp is, is right in here. Okay, so this lingual cusp is going to be just nestling in, but it's not a great contact because you're going to see that this tooth is really, it's in. So let me just mark it in pen so you can see it, okay? So here's that lingual cusp. And that lingual cusp is going to nestle in, okay? You can see it. And it's nestling in, let me just mark it in black, kind of right in that little area there. So let me bring it up to focus focus there we go so it's nestling in in there okay so now that kind of starts to make sense now that i'm coloring it and you can see it so what's happening is i put this down and i grab my teeth to show you okay so i'm actually bringing that it's it's out it's out right it's because that tooth is coming in because of the the nature of the arch so I've kind of got it so that, imagine that's the, the premolar, okay? So it's not a, a great contact. It's kind of wrestling up and nestling in there. That's fine. I can get away with that because again, I've got the freedom and centric teeth and there's not gonna be a lot of chewing going on. The chewing's happening back here. So I have just a, the, the smallest contact and I'm not worried about this because I know that's not where most of the chewing's happening. It's happening here where I have the full contact. I'm bringing this in because I can, because that's how the teeth are designed. I can get away with this, okay? So I'm gonna swing around and carry on. So bear with me, I need to heat some wax. Okay, so let's get our bearings of where we are. Okay, so I am setting now the cuspid, the lower cuspid, okay? And the lower cuspid is, is um, it's right here on the curvature. I'm, I'm nestled into the ridge, and I'm also making sure from an angulation perspective, I'm, my, my neck area of the tooth uh, is right into the ridge, so I'm not... Uh, I'm not having the tooth bulk everything out because we're going to have a nice thinner wax up here because again it's tight muscularly. Now that lower cuspid is sitting against an upper premolar and that's fine. I'm not worried about that because again uh, behind the frame of it everything will just look like teeth you see. You don't see oh uh, 
that looks flat or that looks odd, you just see cusps. Okay, so let me carry on. Paul, any questions that are popping up here? While I'm slaving away? Paul will come back to us. Okay, so now I'm gonna set the lateral in. Okay, and I'm going to set the central end. So what you may have to do when this transpires, uh, my dear colleagues, is you may have to um, have different sizes of, of teeth, okay? So this cuspid is an L35. This lateral and this central are L33s. So they're just a smaller uh, version. So you can see now that I've got it lined up from the midline perspective. I have it now so that the necks of the teeth are butted right, look at that, they're butted right into the ridge. So I don't have bulk here. What you can do sometimes is cut this back a little bit if you need to, so that we have a, a better transition with the wax. And now you can see there's this very large uh, developing um, overbite, but um, we're going to live with that for now uh, because of the case. I wanted to, sh to set this up and then we're going to do the wax trying on the patient to see. Now, sometimes you're going to say you can't leave that type of uh, overbite and overjet uh, for phonetics. We have to see what the patient's tongue does. We have to see what their anatomy is. This isn't necessarily wrong. What I'm doing is I'm setting teeth. I've used model analysis to guide me from the center line. Again, cuspid. I know where the cuspid goes, and I know where the molar goes, okay? And now I've set the teeth according to that to, for stability purposes. So now, because I have freedom and centric, because this rocks, if necessary, I can bring these teeth even higher, okay, and close down that, that spacing that's in there. So think of the video of that patient where I had, gosh, what was it, six or seven millimeters of over, of over um, bite, uh, yet when she spoke, it looked like nothing. It looked like that wasn't there, yet when she closed into centric. So I had this really odd-looking setup because of course I had this huge over, over uh, bite. So something like this initially, you know, again, without the patient's involvement looks odd and weird. Don't get distracted by that because you gotta put this in someone's mouth and then see what it looks like and then adjust accordingly. And then I have the ability to move these teeth higher and I can, I can move these teeth higher and, and yes, they would rest above plane of occlusion but that might work with the jaw relationship and how they speak. So again, I'm, I'm not just governed by everything has to be congruent. I went to school and, and was taught that when I do a setup, everything had to be in line and perfect and everything had to, to, to be, as I reach into my bag of dentures, You know, everything had to be perfect and symmetrical and everything, that's that's dentures, that's how it should be. And what I've realized now in, in, in my journey as a as a practitioner is that's not that's not how it has to be. It can be weird looking and it can have this the anterior teeth way above plane of occlusion. That's that's how it works for that person's mouth. This is where they chew. That's what matters. And I'm using teeth and flexibility here that 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 guide me in. So I'm going to add in. I hear can Paul. Can I, can I Paul. jump in real quick? A uh, couple Paul. of things. The hallway uh, monitor. <laughs> first, it is is uh, trying in a wax denture without the base plate. Would it be rigid enough in the mouth? Um. Yeah, I'm going to say. 
Yeah, so I'm gonna say no, um, unless you sculpt it really well. Um, I use, what I use, I don't use a base plate, everyone. So we're gonna go off topic really quickly, okay? Bear with me while I show you what I do. Okay, I use this. So this is Candular Hard Modeling Wax, okay? From Candular. So there it is forever on video so people can see it. Okay. All right. I use this. Why? Because this is like a denture base. Okay. It's hard. It's a bugger to work with, everyone, um, because, of course, it, it breaks really easy. Okay. But you have to warm it gently, and then it flows in. Because I'm trying to emulate this, which is acrylic. And I want that that hard uh, and and smooth sheen um, that I can get. So I don't use uh, say light cure or or such or or um, I know people are starting to get into printed base plates. I want it nice and thin and I want it smooth to affect like a denture. So when this wax triangle goes in the mouth, it's emulating a denture as much as possible. So uh, with that said. Um, so the base is hard wax, and then I use the pink modeling wax to set the teeth. Okay? Awesome. One more quick one. Um, do you think digital technology, as high-tech as it is now, can incorporate your technical philosophy? Uh, the answer is yes, because I've done it, and I've got some articles coming uh, to be published within Vita and Vita Germany regarding some pretty cool things that we've done with... Uh, uh, with class three and class two, where we had to really uh, push the limits of the software technology. So the answer is yes, but uh, the difference is the software technology doesn't let me add teeth like I'm doing here. We have to kind of work within the scope of, of a first premolar, second premolar, first molar, second molar. It's then how we, how we positioned and lined the cusps up and that's the beauty of this type of occlusal design is it doesn't matter really what what cusp goes into what fossa so long as there's a cusp in the fossa okay so to the answer your question yes digital technology can be manipulated to follow this theory yes but you're going to have to finesse it and 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 spend a lot of time on the mouse, where here I'm just spending the time with my hands. But, but yes, we've done it. And yes, it can be done. Okay? We're pushing it. But that, that thinking of Top Gun, that's our job up there. Um, <laughs> see how I can work in a Top Gun reference into teeth? Um, and Lady Gaga. So yes, we're doing it. And, and yes, we are trying to test the limits of the software. Um, the beauty of it, again, is, is because it's not a locked-in occlusion and I have that wiggle, wiggle room, I have the ability to put in different antagonists where required, so long as there's a cusp in the fossa. So you can drag the setup digitally and move it so long as the cusps line up. And then I might have to do some, some adjustment after the fact in the mouth, uh, to handle again the the consideration of of uh, non-interfering cusps, but we we're doing it. Yes. Okay. So now I've added in the second molar. So again, the idea behind that is again that lingual cusp. There's the distal lingual. That's going to nestle into the center fossa and then the distal lingual right there. And that's, again, uh, staying away from the metromolar pad, so I'm right at the limits. So I don't have to use a smaller first molar, I can actually sneak these both in. Okay, so um, this is what I wanted to essentially show you. I, I worked backwards on this instead of setting the anterior teeth up first, 
I, I backtracked. I did the model analysis so I know where the teeth had to go. Then I set the lower molar first for stability. And so now this follows the arch and arc. And again, the, the, the functional limits of, of where things are be so that we again aren't having the lip pop this out. I'm in tight. I don't have great contact here, but I don't need great contact here as I'm going to show you different angles. Okay, that, that doesn't bother me because where where is the chewing happening? Right here where the contact is. And then again, from that buckle perspective, and again, you got to put a frame behind this, okay? And someone living and talking, it doesn't look odd. You see cusps, you see a profile, you see an emergence profile, you see a nice arc here, all the teeth line up. Uh, and again, you know, when they speak and talk. And then again, from a function perspective, I'm going to open my articulator and I'm going to follow a chew cycle. And I'm going to follow that and then make sure that I'm not having the hit and slide aspect of it. So that I'm not having that contact on the guiding planes of the teeth up here, okay, on the guiding planes here and having it hit and slide into position. So that's why I'm going to move through and do this type of emotion so that I can feel it. And then again, I'm, I'm going to live within this because of the model analysis tells me this is where I should be placing teeth. Do the try in and then see. I always have the ability to adjust height here, et cetera. And if I had to, again, even push the, the incisal edge out to close this gap, this gap doesn't necessarily mean this person can't talk. Um, I don't know. We have to see, okay? Because remember, they were born this way, so their tongue and 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 phonetics that they speak have adjusted to this. So I can uh, adapt these teeth. And, and, and as I said, uh, and I'll just show you for an example, for fun, I could do this. So you can see how I'm, I've really done that. And that's that one case where I can really, again, where I showed you that six to seven millimeters of, of overbite, I, I had this gradual kind of, step down so i really pushed these teeth up because then that's what allowed her to have that phonetic value and then i can close close that up so i i can't unfortunately you know through my journey i i unfortunately can't do that with every uh tooth that's out there i i've had to i found that what works best for me are the are the vita teeth because of the freedom and centric um theory behind it. Okay, Paul, do we have any questions that have popped up? Okay, I'll keep working. Paul, are you there? Paul may have stepped away from his desk. The whole monitor had to step away. Okay. So I have the ability and then to take these teeth and go above. And that doesn't scare me anymore because again, it's what happens when this goes in uh, and again, functions. So what I do know is again, based on the videos and the context and content that I, I shared with you this morning, most of the chewing happens here on the molar and second molar. I followed down and I'm, I'm, I'm over the crest. I haven't gone off. I've stayed within the confines of this smaller lower ridge. The upper stays within the confines of it being a larger ridge, yet the setup looks, you know, odd from, from what we would consider uh, to be normal, but again, I always have to stop myself and say, yeah, no, who says this isn't normal? Uh, I am in no position for that. I'm going to make this work for this person and this canvas. So I'm, I'm going to laugh, but some people like ketchup on their uh, scrambled eggs. 
I know, catch up on your scrambled eggs. But who am I to say that that's weird? Okay, you're weird for thinking it's weird. Uh, to, to quote that uh, commercial. So this is about, look, you, it is what it is. You are what you are. Um, and I'm, I'm just the, the conductor to make this work. And I'm using teeth that function in here. So again, I've got the right cusps into the right fossas. This is where the majority of the chewing will be happening for this patient, which is right above the model analysis, which is right where the stability is for this case. So all this works. This is what's important and helps your stability. So because on a class two, we typically have stability issues, it was an impression with no handle. I want the patient to, to make a kiss because then that moves that obicularis oris muscle right in that area and that flexes that muscle and gives me that nice roll and what I need uh, from that position. And then I set the teeth up like I've done uh, on this case and then I'm going to take this to the mouth in a try and, and, and see where we're at, okay? So what I wanted to impart with you as we slowly start to finish up um, is that. And then again, moving the articulator regardless of what you have in a chew cycle because this is gonna move in a chew cycle. Again, what I use is I use the pens. So you can use a non-permanent, whether it's a Sharpie or a Statler, made in Germany. Uh, you can use these and I don't use articulating paper because articulating paper bends between the teeth and you can get an erroneous reading. So I'm using this because this is much more fine and finite to show me the true value of it. So I hope that makes sense to, to all of you that have joined uh, me in your efforts today to continue to amp up your denture skills and to be a superhero to your patients um, and, 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 and or your doctors. This was uh, me kind of going through my mindset of where I am and not getting um, scared uh, for lack of a better word, by looking at something that I go, well, this doesn't work. No, you just have to put this in and see. Um, I've, again, been building dentures that I never thought were possible before, yet are functioning in the mouth to this day. Uh, I can build a six to seven millimeter, again, overbite. Like, who thought that possible? Paul, are you there? Yes, sir. Uh, I've got right. a couple of quick questions for you here. Nice. Uh, the first the first one is is are you setting the teeth uh, on a flat plane or a curve? Right. So remember how I did this. Okay. So again, if you take a look, I'm trying to emulate that curve a little bit. Okay. Um, so you can see where the curve was was drawn. Now I'm a little shallow here, so I should probably this should probably uh, punch up a little bit. So I'm trying to follow that that curve, okay? So I'm I'm trying to this following this, okay? As as best as I can, and even even if you see, like I'm I'm actually not that far off, okay? Um, the reason being is because this what I drew down here is the snapshot of time of what this ridge looks like. So I'm actually doing a customized curve of speed to that patient, believe it or not. So again, that's a that's a that's probably a whole other PowerPoint and a webinar to talk about that, that I've, I've done this. So for today's demonstration, you're, you're keen to see that. I've done a customized uh, curve of speed uh, for the teeth. These teeth you can set on a flat plane. There's a built-in curve of speed on these lingual, lingual form teeth. So you can set them flat or you can set them on a 20 degree template. They work in all of those types of environments. You are not stuck to one thing. The reason why is because they're not knuckle tight and they, they are not knuckle tight in centric and they're not knuckle tight when you set them up. So you can set them up flat plane, you can set them up curved plane, it does not matter, they still work. That's the awesome. beauty of this. And Thanks Mark. Pardon me as I, as I I had to swallow there. This is about, I had to let go and get out of my way.
because that was a hard one for me to let go. What do you mean you, I can't set them flat or I can't set them curved? I can, they work in multitudes of different arrangements because this works within that chew cycle of the patient. So I'm letting that define it for me now. And so now I had to get out and say, Mark, it's okay. I'm not stuck to just one way. This is about me molding myself to what the patient needs. All right, Paul, next question. It's been a life sure. journey. Uh, the next one is, if we leave the opening at the anterior, patient might complain they cannot cut food at the front. Do you let right. the patient's lower anterior biting into the palate of the upper? Yes. So I'm going to have to gauge that on the wax try-in. That's, that's a good point. I also need to see how much this moves in the mouth. So I'm going to take the lower off and let me just get the articulator out of the way. I need to see what happens in the mouth. I, I've said it in this relation but it's quite possible that they can posture their jaw forward and get contact. I don't know. I got to get this in the mouth and see. So although it looks weird, I need to get it in the wax try-in, and, and it's quite possible they can do this. Remember, that lady that I had that really strong overbite with, it was, you'd say, there's no way that's going to work, Mark. It's locked in. Yet I put it in her mouth, and she's talking, and the teeth are clearing. Nothing's hitting. Yet you bite into centric, and the thing's buried. So that's what I again when I say I got to get out of my own way is because I don't I don't know what it'll look like in the mouth. I have to though trust my judgment to say now I know that it can exist and now I know it can function. So that's why I said to you, I have the ability now to change the height of these teeth as required. Yes, I might have to really bury them even more and I can get away with it. And then that's going to give that patient that ability to bite into that sandwich. Yes they very well might be able to already because I know that I've set teeth within model analysis which has used those anatomical landmarks to tell me exactly where the teeth need to go so this should be skeletally correct for this person because I set it to model analysis so it should be skeletally correct given on how they've formed and grown <clears throat> so now in the mouth that just might be fine for them I need to check that, <clears throat> but I can let go. <clears throat> Pardon me as I need to just take a sip. It's been a lot of talking. I, I know enough to say that that gap may not be a problem in the mouth at all. I'm not going to correct it here because this is where it should be according to model analysis. So I'm going to see how that is in the mouth and then verify. Don't get scared by how it looks here. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. Uh, another question is, is it possible to start from the upper anteriors, lower anteriors, and continue with the lower posteriors and finish with the upper posteriors? <clears throat> yes, absolutely. <clears throat> Pardon me again. I started here to show model analysis and stability of why I approach it this way. And then as I progressed forward, I let it develop and follow. This is, I started here because this is the most important for the stability of the denture. And then as I move forward, I can craft and, and sneak it in. Can you start at the front and work your way back? Absolutely. But knowing though, that as I set all the teeth up, I need to still end up with those molars right there. So, so long as that happens, that's okay. I started here and backtracked knowing that model analysis, I trust it. It's going to let me follow and I can I can adjust. But to answer your question, my dear colleague, yes, it doesn't matter. You can you can do it whichever way you want, but the end goal is that. That's going to help with your stability and right here by keeping those teeth where they are. Yes. Excellent. Thanks, question. Mark. Uh, last one, it says, if one side is different than the other, one side is heavily curved, the other side is flat, you follow each ridge independently of each other, or do you split the difference between the two and keep it the occlusal plane symmetrical? Okay. Let me take light out of my eyes. 
Uh, great question. Okay, when I use that compass and I draw it, I set to what the compass shows me. So one ridge might be flatter, the other one might have a bigger dip. That's how I do it. And that's how I do it now. Um, so the answer to that question is, is I let that model analysis guide me on how to set the teeth. So I'm not looking for it to be symmetrical. Um, then I check it in the mouth and see what it looks like behind the frame of the, of the person's lips and face to make sure it's okay. And sometimes I might dumb it down then if it looks a little bit too much curved, but I, I don't follow the symmetrical approach anymore. I follow uh, the model analysis and, and what the person's giving me, and that's what I follow. So to answer your question, yeah, if it's not the same, then it's not the same. Then the one side will be different than the other. But then that's how it should be skeletally and in the frame. It should work because the because it's telling me that it should fit within the frame because it should be the same. Why am I saying it's the same? Is because again, we are all golden proportioned. So everything here is mathematically equated, and everything here is golden proportioned. So if one side's different than the other, it'll still be proportioned in my face to make it look like it fits because it should, because it's proportioned as such. So that's why I'm not looking so much now that everything here has to be the same. It doesn't. I've let go of that. And, and believe me, everyone, it's really hard to get out of your way because we're looking for everything to be perfect and symmetrical. And now I'm letting go of that and realizing that I don't have to have it like that. And that's okay. Because again, it's what does it look like within the frame of that person? That's that's the end goal. All right, Paul, next question. That that kind of does it for us today, Mark. Oh, well, all right then. So what did we learn, everybody? Well, number one, you're rock stars. Uh, number two, thanks very much for uh, for coming and joining uh, me and my journey and letting me share as as we push forward to try and again make our professions uh, even better and care for patients. This is about amping up your skills uh, and challenging yourself. Uh, the goal today was to show you this, to go, huh, uh, you know, and then see how that fits in with, with you. Um, I'm here as well. Uh, Paul will put up my information. You can contact me privately. Um, my goal is to help and support you. Again, my thanks to Vita North America and to Paul for supporting our professions and our growth uh, for us to be superheroes. So uh, thanks for investing in yourself and in your time. And if you need me, you contact me privately. So Paul will Paul will be the help of the, the monitor and, and grab control of the screen and put up our information and our contact information um, for Vita and myself. Um, so again, this was about using product that I can flex and manipulate and it's fine, it still works. And I can't do that, unfortunately, with other manufacturers. And that's why I've fallen into this and it's worked really well. And I'm not scared by these types of situations or relationships anymore because I have that confidence moving forward of, of my understanding of, again, the golden proportions, model analysis, <clears throat> and now the theory of how the teeth were designed, that they all work in conjunction. And it's just, I'm just the conductor that just puts it all together. Um, and that's how I see myself now where the, the patient and I'm just molding myself to them and I use product that allows me to do it. So thanks again, everyone, for uh, for joining me. Paul? Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. We always uh, appreciate it when you come <coughs> and teach us new stuff. So thank you. Appreciate thank it. you for sharing your expertise with us. Uh, there are a couple of questions. I think a couple of people came in late. Uh, just to remind you, you guys should get an email about your CE credits. Um, and also, uh, you know, if you don't see one in the next day or two, uh, let us know and we'll get it to you. Uh, also, we recorded this and we can get you a copy of that as well. Uh, let us know if you want one. And then we've got uh, some other stuff that will be on our VITA North America YouTube page. Um, here, if you have any questions about any of the product or any of the stuff that we uh, uh, talked about today, uh, here is the, the help desk, and you can either call myself or Jim. We'll be happy to help you. Uh, if you have any questions about pricing and stuff, 
Uh, here are your sales reps, your local sales reps, and they can get you information on pricing and that kind of stuff. Um, also, again, our YouTube North America YouTube page, we've got you know lots of different videos, uh, a bunch from Mark and some of the others. And let's see, we've got some more stuff from Mark coming up. And then, of course, here is Mark's uh, info. And there was a couple of co last minute questions. One says, are these teeth available in digital libraries? Yeah. The, the answer is uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, we have our, our digital Vigo library, which is based it's on just, Excel and Lingo forms. Um, yes, just to help Paul, it's just, it's called Vigo instead of Excel, but it's the same, uh, it's the same, it's essentially the same tooth. Um, just with the Vigo on it, just to differentiate that it's the digital. So the answer is yes. Sorry, Paul, take over. No, no, you're good. Um, no, Mark's right. And it's available for a three shape and ExoCAD. They're free. Uh, if you want more information on it, email me and I can get you all of that info. Uh, if you guys need anything else, like I said, uh, you know, here's Mark's information. Uh, if you need uh, anything from myself, uh, you can download, uh, shoot me an email and I'll, I'll get you the tutorials on it, but you can actually, 3Shape, you can download it directly from the control panel. ExoCAD, you have to request it from ExoCAD. Uh, Almond Gerbach, you can download it from your AG Live. So if you, like I said, if you want more uh, information on the digital stuff, email me. Otherwise, uh, here's Mark's info. And again, thanks so much, Mark, for uh, helping right. us out today. Thank you for the rest of you for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, whoop, whoop, whoop. Forward to seeing you guys next time. Awesome. Thanks very much, everyone. Take care. All right. And thank you. Thank you for investing in yourself. Have a great day. That's